following my video on Western culture, I was encouraged maybe to make another clip on a similar topic. So I decided to share with you what little I know about the matter of Western sculpture. Now, I am no expert. I am not an art historian. But I have always felt a great love for sculpture, and so over time I have acquired a little knowledge on the subject. We know the Greeks and the Romans had already mastered the art of sculpture to a very high degree of expertise. They clearly understood anatomy, and thus were able to bring forth bodies from the stone or cast them in bronze like no other civilization on earth at the time. Names of great sculptors such as Praxiteles, Phidias, and Lysippos have come down to us through the ages. The Greeks clearly sought a romantic ideal in their portrayal of man. Beauty, strength, athleticism, excellence. It is all there in their depiction of the human form. This is the dying Gaul, an extraordinarily lifelike rendition of the defeated warrior. So perfectly has he been captured in marble, you expect him to breathe at any moment. Here is Hercules, leaning on his club, resting after having successfully stolen the apples of the Hesperides. You sense the heft and power of this colossus, even though this figure is at rest. Meanwhile, this is merely the Roman copy, the Greek original by Lysippos having been lost in time. The Apollo Belvedere was long understood to be the physical ideal of man. Well built, yet not possessed of the heft of a figure like Hercules, this Apollo is graceful, caught in mid-motion and appearing almost weightless. Statues of Alexander the Great were spread all across his empire, showing him as the youthful athletic warrior king that he was, with more than a touch of the divine thrown in for good measure. But those were the Greeks. The Republican Romans, on the other hand, were interested in the depiction of men of note as they truly were, warts and all. They celebrated not youthful beauty, but gravitas, dignity, honor. The citizen politician was their ideal, not the strength of the athlete, but strength of character. Perhaps the most glorious example of this Republican tradition is this remarkable bust of Julius Caesar. It shows us a man of thought and restraint, but so too one of a forceful will and fortitude. This man conquered barbarians, set foot on land which was semi-mythical to his countrymen, and brought down an empire. What a face! Once the emperors came along with their vanity and their absolute power, naturally a more flattering style took hold very quickly. What needs to be pointed out is that, also during Roman times, sculpture seemed to remain Greek. Romans were not artists at heart. If anything, they were either soldiers, and therefore good at killing people, or lawyers and politicians, and thus skilled at wringing the life from their victims more slowly. But the great flowering of sculpture under the Greeks seemed already to be diminishing with the Roman rule. Somehow the magic was dissipating. What caused this? No one knows. A great deal of Roman sculpture was in fact just the copying of old Greek masterpieces. If there was one thing, however, one must grant the Romans, it was that they, or their Greek artists, that is, had a knack for relief work. There are astonishingly beautiful examples of relief work left behind by the Romans. The Ara Pazis, the breathtaking Portonaccio sarcophagus. But the most outstanding such example is most likely Trajan's column, depicting the emperor's campaign to conquer the kingdom of Dacia. But as the Roman Empire began to wane, so did the craftsmanship of the sculptors. The magic of the ancients was gradually lost. The medieval saw statues relegated to architectural features. Sculptures of saints were now little more than adornments for cathedrals. In keeping with the soaring nature of the architecture, they needed to be long and relatively straight, in order not to disturb the architect's lines of the much more important building. There was therefore not much to be had from medieval sculpture. But then in Florence something happened. Already in 1329, a set of bronze doors had been commissioned for the baptistry. This was very early Renaissance stuff, having been fashioned by Andrea Pisano, and it still owes a great deal to the medieval. 
Then, in 1402, another commission for another set of doors to the baptistry was announced. The joint winners of the contest were Lorenzo Ghiberti and Filippo Brunelleschi. They were supposed to work together, but Brunelleschi was not one to share the glory and left. It was hardly to his detriment. Brunelleschi is known as one of the fathers of the Renaissance, and most of all is famed for his development of perspective and for the dome that tops Florence Cathedral. Ghiberti, meanwhile, completed the doors without him. They were still very much in keeping with the design of the first doors, albeit that they were artistically more advanced and elaborate. It should make Ghiberti famous, but the man was not yet finished. Another commission was granted in 1425 for yet another set of doors. But now the gloves were off. Now the Renaissance was no longer playing around. Gone was sticking to the old design. Now Ghiberti reinvented the ancient world on ten panels on two bronze doors which became known as the Gates of Paradise. If you want to know the place in which the Renaissance in sculpture burst forth, this set of doors is it. Perspective. Glorious perspective. Had his first set of doors made Ghiberti famous, this set of doors made him immortal. Then, around 1430, Donatello was commissioned by Cosimo de' Medici to fashion him a statue of David. Donatello was in fact one of the finalists for the commission for the 1401 competition for the bronze doors to the baptistry, and had lost to Ghiberti and Brunelleschi. But that was not going to stop him. He created his David, and it was a sensation. It was not some dour-looking saint. Here was a body. And the statue did nothing else than celebrate the glorious human form. With his masterpiece, Donatello had propelled mankind back into the world of the ancients. To many a modern viewer, this figure may feel uncomfortable, as its subject is self-evidently a naked boy. And some feel there is an eroticism about the portrayal of said boy. But this statue's importance in art history is quite clear. Donatello was introducing into a Christian world the aesthetic of the ancient Greeks. It was a revolution. Ghiberti and Donatello had done it. They had built on the creations of those who had gone before them, and had flung us into an age of beauty. Sculpture became once again one of the preeminent forms of European art. Once we hit the high renaissance in sculpture, we invariably meet the man whom the Italians called the Divine. He gave us pieces which are so charged with life and emotion that we struggle to believe they were carved by the hands of a mortal being. Michelangelo stands without equal among the sculptors. It was the Pietà which made his name. A statue of a beautiful sadness of the Madonna holding the dead Christ in her arms. This is art beyond all comprehension. At his best, Michelangelo connected with us on an instinctive level. The body of Jesus is broken and lifeless, and Mary is filled with such supreme grace and sorrow, it defies words. Then there is, of course, his David. What makes this statue even more extraordinary is that it was carved from a giant block the shape of which another sculptor had already roughed out for an entirely different statue. Michelangelo was approached to see whether he could make anything of it. Michelangelo was extraordinary. For one, he did not work as any other sculptor would. He was famous for his ability to carve marble at great speed. Frankly, nobody seemed to possess the skill and sheer physical prowess to work stone like he did. But what made him stand out yet more was his technique. Whereas any other sculptor would roughly shape the entire stone, and then gradually reduce it down to compose the detail, Michelangelo just delved into the stone, and found the figure within it. Here are some unfinished statues of his, generally referred to as the prisoners, and you can see them emerging from the rock almost in their finished form. Nobody worked like this. Michelangelo was unique. No one would ever compare. I find that some of his later work lost some appeal. His free style resulting in at times awkward looking figures. But even then he was still capable of sublime grace. You gaze upon the face of this, his unfinished Medici Madonna, and you understand why they called Michelangelo divine. The tradition of high renaissance sculpture 
was carried on by men like Gian Lorenzo Bologna. Just like Michelangelo had in his later years, so did Bologna embrace the concept of the figura serpentina, a serpentine or twisting figure, which would therefore allow for interesting views from many angles. Perhaps his most famous work is the Rape of the Sabine Woman. Three figures atop each other, offering views from any direction. Where the High Renaissance ends and the Baroque begins is hard to define. The man who dominated the Baroque was none other than Gian Lorenzo Bernini. The new heights to which he took sculpture were hitherto unimagined. Not only did he instill tremendous drama into the figures he produced, but so too was he incredibly prolific. So much work did he take on that he could impossibly do it all himself. So he would pay other sculptors to rough out the figures or finish certain detail for him to apply the great artistry beyond that. At one point he is said to have had in his employ every other sculptor in Rome. Much like Michelangelo, Bernini is said to have had a remarkable work method. When sculpting portrait busts, he would not just make very detailed sketches from every angle as would any other sculptor. No, Bernini fashioned a sort of caricature. He wished later to recall the essence of the man, the character. Nowhere is that devotion to the character of his subject more obvious than in his celebrated bust of Cardinal Borghese. You gaze at this likeness and you expect it to blink. Bernini caught him so astutely in what appears to be mid-thought, he managed to capture what can only be described as a photographic instant entrapped in stone. The sheer number of Bernini masterpieces defies belief. That said, he did rely heavily on the various other sculptors in his employ. Here are Neptune and Triton bestriding the sea. Here the ecstasy of Santa Teresa. The magnificent double statue of the Rape of Proserpina. And the fantastically dramatic figure of Saint Longinus at Saint Peter's Basilica. These are merely some highlights of a body of work that beggars belief. But Bernini would not live forever. Nobody could match the sheer power of his work. The Baroque slowly grew ever more ponderous and flabby. No longer was it the energetic, joyous form of expression we had seen with a master such as Bernini. Now it more and more became a tired and tiresome convention. Nowhere more so can that be observed than in some Catholic churches and cathedrals of the German-speaking world, which seemed to have been invaded by veritable armies of cupids, and where the sculptures had been reduced to being part of the decor. Taste, one felt, was giving way to meaningless flamboyance and so one sought to rediscover grace. One effectively tried to reconnect with a more classical aesthetic. Neoclassical was born. Its prince among men was no doubt Antonio Canova. He was to the neoclassical what Bernini had been to the Baroque. An untouchable master, with a slightness of touch which made him incomparable in his age. Here is Psyche revived by Cupid's kiss. One beholds a statue such as this and struggles to believe that it was in fact crafted from stone, for there appears to be no weight to it at all. Canova's most famous piece, no doubt, is that of the Three Graces. Again, he achieves a delightful tenderness, which one cannot believe it is possible to hammer and chisel into cold, hard stone. But so too the neoclassical should come to an end. It too seemed to run aground. Not everyone was a Canova. Lifeless Britannias and other national symbols began cluttering up the cityscapes. Soldiers' monuments, forgotten generals, and, perhaps worst of all, stone politicians started proliferating about the place. And so, once more, maybe one last time, a new form was sought. It was found, just as in painting, in Impressionism. Its foremost master in sculpture was undoubtedly Auguste Rodin. Here is one of what I deem his two greatest works, the thinker. It crystallizes that singular idea of the thinking man. No great detail is necessary. It is the idea, 
the essence of man and thought, so it dispenses with anything the artist deems superfluous to that singular idea. With it, Rodin created an icon that almost everyone in the Western world recognizes instantly. The second of his greatest works contains much the same magic. Here too he concentrates on one particular idea. The kiss. The embrace of man and woman in that one intoxifying moment. It was a deliberate sacrifice of detail by a master who had proven in earlier work of being capable of great intricacy. Rodin was no longer interested in locks of hair and curlicues. He was interested in the essence of the thing, and so he sought to recapture that, and that alone. But the stay of Impressionism was a short one. It gave way to the onslaught of abstract and brutalist sculpture. Beauty was undone. Unsightly Lenins and heroic workers, as well as unidentifiable blobs, began to populate the world of sculpture. For millennia, for centuries, the artistry of sculpture had shone and given the world unremitting beauty. Yet, as with all things, it came to an end. A few brave souls no doubt soldier on, seeking to keep alive the dying embers. Yet for the rest of us, all that is left is to wait. And hope. That is all from the Sabah Pass for now. Thank you very much, and goodbye.